You are listening to an American Free Press podcast. Joining me on the line is Jacob B. Hornberger, the founder and president of the Future of Freedom Foundation. Jacob, thanks a lot for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. Nice to be here, Dave. Jacob, I saw a great article that you wrote about Lynn Stewart, that attorney who was locked away for about 10 years. And I want to get into that in a minute. But before we do, for the benefit of listeners, can you give them a little bit of background about who you are and what is the Future of Freedom Foundation? Yeah, I'm president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, which is a nonprofit cash exempt educational foundation whose mission is to provide an uncompromising case for the libertarian philosophy. We were founded in 1989, and our website is fff.org, and that's what we do. We publish articles, we have seminars, we have conferences to educate people on the principles of libertarianism. And you were a trial attorney for 12 years in Texas, is that right? That's right. I was practicing law, and I discovered libertarianism. I was offered a job at a libertarian economic nonprofit foundation in New York, and so I gave up the law practice some 25 years ago and went to work for that foundation and then ultimately left there to start the Future of Freedom Foundation. In a nutshell for the listeners, can you define libertarianism? Well, libertarian is the shorthand rendition that people sometimes use is economically conservative and socially liberal. On economic issues, we oppose the entire welfare state concept, the idea of coerced mandatory charity. We believe that there should be a total separation of charity in the state, where people keep everything they earn and decide for themselves whether to take care of their parents or the sick or donate to their churches or their local museums and so forth. And then on the foreign policy side, civil liberties side, we're very, very strong advocates of civil liberties. We oppose the whole idea of a military empire where the troops are invading and occupying foreign countries, stirring up anger and hatred against the United States that results in this constant threat of terrorism. We oppose all the infringements on civil liberties. We oppose the drug war. Libertarians are just strong on freedom principles all across the board, both in economic, civil liberties, foreign policy. And I guess where we're at now in the United States, this experiment of the United States on a scale of one to 10 in the libertarian chart, where would we be right now? Well, if one is the worst, we're about at one. Things are really bad from a libertarian standpoint in terms of what the government's doing. When the military has the power to round up Americans and send them into military dungeons and torture them and keep them detained indefinitely, that is not consistent with a free society. And then when the government's driving the whole economy into the gutter with this massive out-of-control spending, debt, welfare statism, this is not a good situation that we're in, both on the economic side and the civil liberty side. And that's why we spend about 50-50 in terms of our time and effort here at the Future of Freedom Foundation on economic issues and foreign policy civil liberties issues. Do you think that we're past the point of no return, or do you think there's a slim chance that the United States would return to its roots? Oh, I think there's a very good chance. I mean, and libertarians are very encouraged. I mean, we saw this in the Ron Paul campaign where there's this huge surge of libertarianism. We had no idea that there were so many people, especially young people, that are ardent, devoted libertarians. And so it's a huge movement. I mean, I had no idea it had gotten this big. And so ideas matter. Ideas have consequences. They could bring down the Berlin Wall without firing a shot and entirely peacefully, just through the power of ideas, we can certainly put this country back on the right track, but that's an educational task, and that's what we keep doing at the Future Freedom Foundation. Now, Lynn Stewart, this is a fascinating story because she was an attorney representing an accused terrorist. I think the fellow's name was Rahman or something like that, right? Yeah, Omar Abdel Rahman. I wanted to give the listeners a little bit of background about her and how she got into this row with the U.S. government. Well, Lynn Stewart is an elderly lady. I think she's probably like 70 or so. And she's had a long, distinguished career of representing underdogs, as many times not very sympathetic clients. But, you know, she takes the position that everybody's entitled to an attorney, even the person that's accused of the most despicable crimes ever. And she's represented some guys that they're charged with pretty despicable crimes. But she always gave them a very, very good defense, which is what being a criminal defense lawyer is all about. She fought hard for her clients in the process. She angered prosecutors. A lot of prosecutors don't like lawyers that fight that hard for their clients. She worked with William Kunstler, one of the most ardent criminal defense lawyers in 
the history of the criminal defense bar. So she has this long career of representing the underdog, a lot of times doing cases for free. And then all of a sudden, she's asked to represent this guy, Abdel Rahman, by Ramsey Clark, who served as the attorney general under uh, Lyndon Johnson. And she reluctantly takes on the case. And he had been accused of planning some terrorist attacks here in the United States after the 1993 attack on the World Trade Center. And he gets prosecuted for that. She represents him. He gets convicted. And in the process, she signed this agreement with respect to prison regulations that she will not divulge any communications from him to his group in Egypt, which has been designated a terrorist organization by the U.S. government. Well, she violates that regulation and at a press conference reads a press release from this guy. And as a result of reading that press release, the feds come after her for violating the prison regulations and more important for what they said was material support of terrorism by virtue of the words that were in this press release. She's convicted. She's sentenced to serve 28 months in jail. She has breast cancer and she, of course, loses her law license. And after she leaves the courtroom, she mocks the Senate. She says, "Ah, I can do this sentence standing on my head. And well, that infuriates the prosecutors and the federal judge. So they call her back in and up the sentence to 10 years. And Hmm. that sentence is finally upheld. And her lawyer is now appealing that to the full circuit court panel of all the judges saying, you know, that this violates freedom of speech issues and so forth. But that in a nutshell, now we can get down to what that communication is, but that in a nutshell is the Lynn Stewart case. She is now sitting in a federal penitentiary serving out a 10-year sentence, 70 years old, got breast cancer, herself. It's effectively a life sentence for her life. Yeah, I'm looking right here on Wikipedia. It says that she was born in October 1939, so she's 73 right now. On November 19, 2009, she surrendered to U.S. Marshals in New York City to begin serving a 28-month sentence. And then, again, as you just mentioned, they decided to give her 10 because she got sassy with them. And, of course, being sassy, that automatically tacks on eight years somebody's sentence. Can't be sassy to authority, I guess. How did they justify that? Well, they go off on technical grounds that it was clear that her mocking the sentence is what hacked them off. But then the appellate court judges issue a resentencing saying, well, we think that the district judge, the sentencing judge, didn't take everything into account that he should have taken into account, including this factor, this factor, and this factor. So when the case was appealed back to that same three-judge panel after the district judge had upped it up to 10 years, the lawyer for Lynn Stewart, who's another famous criminal defense lawyer, he argued that, look, you're punishing her for free speech. Why shouldn't she be free to say whatever she wants after she gets sentenced? And the judges there said, oh, no, no, that's not really what she got sentenced for. She got the extra eight years because of these technical factors that the judge decided to take into consideration that he had not taken into consideration in the first place. Well, you know, as Ferringer argues, this has all the makings of a sham, that the real reason is what she said, and that's what Ferringer's appealing to the full multi-judge panel, that the real reason isn't what she said, and that this technical thing is really just a way to cover that up. And what's her status right now? Her conviction and her 10-year sentence has been upheld by a three-judge panel of the Court of Appeals. And she has a right to appeal that last upholding of the 10-year sentence to the entire Court of Appeals instead of just a three-judge panel, all the judges. So they will decide whether to hear that appeal. And if they deny that hearing, then Stewart has the right to appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, and there's every indication that she intends to do that. And what are the chances of the justice taking that up, you think? I would say that she's got a shot at the Court of Appeals, you know, a full in-bank hearing. I would say that her chances that the Supreme Court will take up the case are slim and none. I mean, I think she's got a slim case anyway because all this war on terrorism nonsense where the federal courts have so often just submitted and deferred to the national security state and anything involving national security and war on terrorism and stuff, there's a strong indication that so many times they just bent over and rolled over and deferred to whatever the national security state's doing. My personal opinion is that she's got a tough road to hoe here. I liked how you compared our current state of affairs in the United States to Egypt under Mubarak. It's exactly true. We are under a dictatorship, it seems, aren't we? Well, it's fascinating, and this is the argument we've been making since 9-11, is that these powers that Bush just assumed by decree, he said, I'm a commander-in-chief, and we're at war now. We're at war. You know, even though terrorism has long been a criminal offense, it still is a criminal offense under the U.S. Code. They still prosecute terrorist cases. In fact, this is a good example. Here's a terrorist terrorist case prosecuted in federal court where Lynn Stewart was the lawyer. But he says, well, I'm going to declare war on this criminal offense, 
and now I have these extraordinary emergency powers that are going to be temporary, but oh, by the way, the war on terrorism is going to last forever, and these are the powers that the military now has to take Americans into custody, park them away to a concentration camp or a military dungeon, torture them, hold them indefinitely, which is exactly what they did with American citizen Jose Padilla. We took a leading role in that case, too, here at the Future of Freedom Foundation, opposing the assumption of these and the exercise of these extraordinary powers, because ironically, these same powers are the very powers that Mubarak was wielding and exercising that the demonstrators, the protesters, were demanding that he surrender. Now, he had wielded these powers for 30 years after the assassination of Anwar Sadat. He said, oh, well, now, see, now we've got a terrorist emergency here in Egypt. These will be temporary powers. Well, 30 years later, they're still in existence. They're rounding up people. They're torturing them. And ironically, here in the United States is the bastion of freedom where the president now has the same power that Mubarak was wielding. Incredible, Dave, that we live in a country where those kind of powers are being held and exercised. And very few people are doing anything about it, it seems. Well, that's right, because you see, they don't see it happening in a widespread manner. And then we kept arguing that in the Padilla case and why the Padilla case is so important, because it sets the precedent that once they can do it to one American, and that's why they chose Padilla, because Padilla is not a most sympathetic guy. You're not going to sit here and say, oh, you know, I want him to be my best friend. So they pick out the most unsympathetic guy they could find, and the Court of Appeals upheld what they did to Padilla. And when the case was going to reach the U.S. Supreme Court, the Justice Department and the military get together and say, this was after they had told the federal courts that this guy was an enemy combatant, that national security required him to be treated as an enemy combatant, that he's not a criminal defendant. They all of a sudden take away jurisdiction out of the Supreme Court and return Padilla to criminal defendant status, where he's prosecuted and convicted of the crime of terrorism. And so, as the law now stands in the United States, they can now do to Padilla to every single American. All they need is a good crisis. And so, the reason people are not up in arms right now, except us libertarians and a few liberals, is because these powers are not being used in a widespread manner. But all of a sudden, you get one big crisis, and they've got all these court decisions now under their belt, allowing them to do what Mubarak does, and his secret police were doing, and so forth. And that's rounding up people and sending them into the dungeons, torturing them. That's not good no. Yeah, they do have no, everything. Ominous. Yeah, it's ominous because they do have all of these cases there for president, right? And they're ready to go. Exactly, exactly. That's what's scary is that that is now the state of the law. What they did to Padilla, they can now do to every American. And that's what's so scary, because all they need is another crisis. I mean, you recall after 9-11, all the fear, and you wouldn't believe the hate mail that was pouring into our organization when we were opposing the war on Iraq, which was just nothing but a war of aggression. I mean, right. Iraq didn't have anything to do with 9-11. And people were so scared and panicked and all this that they were willing to support anything that the national security state did. And Bush knew that. That's why he was able to get away with his invasion of Iraq and so forth. Well, all you need is that kind of crisis, and they've now got these powers under their belt. They're ready to go to the situation. Call for it. Your organization, Future Freedom Foundation, got a really cool URL, triplef.org. When did you grab that? Years ago, huh? Yeah, we were really lucky that this guy who was helping us out just loved our work. A young guy, he says, hey, you know, on the Internet, they've got this new thing going on with URLs. And he says, I'd like to construct your website. And we didn't understand. We had no idea what it was all about. And we said, sure, you know, and he was going to do it for free. And so he constructed a website for us, and he got the URL, FFF.org. He even called us. And he said, you guys want FFF.org or FFF.com? And we said, we don't care. Do whatever you want to do. We didn't know what to do. <laughs> Right. Because of it was. And sure enough, boy, we, we were really fortunate. I now wish I had seen the importance of it where I'd gone and bought a bunch of URLs and become a millionaire. Right. Well, they put you in prison because uh, there's precedence on that, too, for squatting on those things. But how do you folk survive financially? Mostly through donations. We've always kind of taken the position that we just put our ideas out in the marketplace. We publish a monthly journal called Future of Freedom, and we publish a daily email publication. And we've always taken the position that if people like our work, they'll help us. And we're not a huge organization, but we are still in existence after 20 years. And people that fund us, they like our style. They like our uncompromising style. They like the way we hit hard. And we never compromise. We have never, ever compromised any principle of libertarianism. So that's how we survive, primarily through donations. We have some subscriptions to our monthly journal, but mostly it's just voluntary donations and grants and so forth. And I'm looking on Wikipedia, and you have an entry there, and you were in the Army for eight years, it says here. Is that correct? 
I went to Virginia Military Institute, and I was commissioned out of there after attending summer camp, second lieutenant in infantry, and spent three months on active duty at infantry school in Fort Benning, and then I spent eight years in the reserves. Thank you for serving. A very small percentage of people in the United States actually do serve in the military. So obviously, if it wasn't for that couple of percent, I think historically it's been about 5% throughout the history of the United States, and it's, I think, much lower now. So if it wasn't for people who actually did that, we'd have no military, right? I mean, not that we've been waging just or legal wars lately. You know, I guess, what, World War II was the last legal war that was waged, I think, right? Right. Now, I've been studying the Swiss system, and the more I learn about Switzerland, the more I think that they have it right. I mean, essentially, our system here in America was founded on the Swiss model. No big standing military establishment. The entire nation of citizen soldiers, they're ready, they're well-trained. The Swiss are well-trained, they're well-armed. They've got conscription there, which libertarians would never agree with, but their entire military system, pretty much, I think they have about 100,000 people on active duty, but the rest of them are all citizen soldiers. People have assault rifles in their houses. They're ready to go. They're well-trained. Shooting is like the national sport. And nobody would dare to invade Switzerland. And notice that Switzerland minds its own business. It doesn't send troops abroad. It doesn't try to get involved in other people's affairs. But the Swiss say don't ever even think of invading us because we will chew you up and spit you out. <laughs> and they would. Their entire society is devoted to legitimate national defense. And I really think that was the model on which America was based throughout the 1800s and that it was just later when we turned to a big military industrial complex, the Cold War national security state, that's been a disaster for us. And so here at FFF, we call for a restoration of a citizen soldier concept, basic military establishment devoted to national defense and get rid of this whole empire, CIA and national security state structure. Eisenhower warned about it how long ago and it's only gotten worse. Now, you ran in 2002 for the U.S. Senate in Virginia as an independent candidate, is that right? That's right. I ran as an independent. And you got, looks like, over 100,000 votes. That's really good. Yeah, it wasn't too bad. I forgot the numbers, but I think it was around 7 or 8%, something like that. Are you thinking of going back in? or? No. I learned, Dave, just through that experience that I'm much better off in this field. In that political campaign, I never have anybody coming up to me saying, hey, you influenced my thinking here. But in FFF's work, it happens regularly where people will write us and say, wow, you have really opened my mind to this. You've really caused my thinking to shift like this. And it's very gratifying when we hear something like that. And I decided that I'm not real good at politics, and I feel much more comfortable in this area, and I think we're doing valuable work, and I love this. Politics is a nasty game, yeah. and this kind of work, I absolutely love. I have the good fortune of really thanking the Lord that I get to come to work every day, because I love what I do in life. That's great. Jacob G. Hornberger, the founder and president of the Future of Freedom Foundation at TripleF.org. I want to thank you so much for the time you spent explaining all this to the listeners, and looking forward to talking to you again. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate the nice interview, Dave.